Hello everyone and welcome to your normal Thursday dose of Capture One stuff. Um, so as normal, for those of you that haven't been um, online before, we're going to talk through the next hour of your images um, or images that you guys have sent in and how we can edit them in Capture One, how we can either recover them um, or do something different or even start from scratch. Um, kind of up to you, we take your steer on that. Um, as always, these sessions are designed to be as interactive as you want them to be. So please, there's loads of you um, already telling me where you're from, um, which is cool. because we've got everyone from uh, Vancouver all the way through to um, Alan is still online from Australia. Good man. Um, and everywhere in between. So please um, interject, um, ask questions as we go, um, put comments in or whatever. Just please bear in mind that there's a little bit of a delay because of the way that live streaming works. So it takes about... Uh, probably sort of five or six seconds for me to see um, your comment in relation to what's actually on the screen. So do bear that in mind. For those of you that already have Capture One, um, we're going to be working on version 21, which is actually 21.1.1 at the moment. So there's a couple of bug releases that came out. Um, if you're not on version 21, so if you're on 21 but not 0.1.1, please update. If it's not showing up in your Capture One software, then maybe go into your preferences, oh sorry, your uh, account on CaptureOne.com, um, download the whole new file anyway, and that'll update you. If you're on version 20, you'll be able to follow along just fine with most stuff, um, or flag when we're using something different that maybe isn't in version 20. Um, but for anyone that are running a version prior to that, so version 12, 11, 10, I think we heard of someone last week using version 9 still, which... Fair play, um, well done for carrying on, but um, it might be time to look at upgrading. So again, go to CaptureOne.com, have a look at what the options are. For those of you that don't have Capture One, or this is completely new to you, um, go to CaptureOne.com, download the free trial. It works completely, fully um, unrestricted for 30 days. Um, no limits or whatever, um, and see how you go. If you don't have a clue what I'm talking about in terms of raw editing and um, photography um, editing on files, then you're probably on the wrong live um, session. Sorry about that. But in the meantime, for the rest of you, let's get into Capture One. So here's our first image. Uh, it's from Joe, uh, a wintry scene. Um, and Joe's, Joe's question, there was actually two elements to this. Um, one, and let me just do before and after. So for those of you that don't know, uh, before and after, if I press the Y key on the keyboard or hit this before up here, um, I get my little split screen slider. If I don't want the split screen slider, hold down on that bar, go to the full view instead, um, and then Y will go literally after, before at a full screen. Um, most people tend to stick with the split screen one, um, but that's up to you. So always with these, we'll always look at what was done to the image. So this is the after, tells me up here and what was the raw image and this is the before um, and joe's challenge was was a couple of things so one um was there was it overdone in that sense in terms of an edit and that depends on your criteria of overdone um but two the healing on this tree of these um these red lines um and whether that was successful or not and to be honest, I was struggling here to, to work out what had gone on because healing doesn't normally leave that sort of, um, let's just zoom in so we can see, this sort of um, wrong coloration, I guess, um, on here. Tree bark is, is notoriously difficult to heal well because the, the shapes are all ironically so random that if, if healing tries to use a pattern, it can look quite obvious um, where it's happened. But what's not normal is this sort of brightening area here because... If I look at the healing layer, um, so if we go into our exposure tab, the one that looks like a histogram, and rather handily, Joe's labelled all the layers quite neatly, we've got a heal layer on there. If I look at our mask, it's over the red part there. Um, but for some reason, even though the origins are coming from up here on this side and down here on this side, for some reason it's brightened up the bark. And for the life of me, I couldn't work out what was going on until I saw... The layer underneath and I think this is one where um, maybe Joe's tried something it didn't quite work so tried something on top of it rather than trying it instead so I'm going to turn off the healing layer so you can see um, those lines but the lines are already slightly different to what was there before so before they were red and now they're I guess desaturated let's call it that so the problem is and in fact, Joe's, <laughs> there we go, Joe's online. Hello, Joe. Um, so the problem is, 
Absolutely, I get it. You've used the style brush to reduce the red. So there's actually a, 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 the style brush formats that you can reduce red um, to try and get rid of those stripes. And that's exactly what Joe's done to start with. And it, to be honest, it probably would have been my first port of call. So if I start from the original here, we've tried this painting on. So there's a painted area there of this reduce red out of the image. And that's taken the red out of it. It's desaturated it. And then we've got a heel layer over the top. And the problem is with the heel layer over the top, effectively, it's now trying to blend in the trick. Because remember, the heel layer isn't just copying. It's trying to blend in what you copy. So the heel layer effectively is blending in this dark area of, of bark up here with what then turned out to be, as a result of this red minus, a very bright area here. And what that's done is the blend has resulted in something that's just a little bit lighter around that bark. If you don't have the red minus layer, just by removing it, now it looks normal. <laughs> so this is one where... And it's actually a good lesson because I've I've done this myself many times. The combination of several things, um, if one doesn't work, the temptation is to try and build another change on top and then build another change on top until it gets right. And you can end up sort of chasing down a rabbit hole. Without this red adjustment, this actually looks like a pretty good heel. I don't notice it. But with that previous red adjustment before the healing layer was done, I've got this weird white or brightened area of the, where those stripes were. And it's just because the heel there has to now try and match this brightness of those stripes to the rest of the bark. Without those stripes reduced in brightness, and we're telling the healing brush just to blend in effectively red into brown, that's quite easy, it does a much better job. So on these ones, um, you know, I, I say it quite often um, with other things for, for different reasons, but... Be careful when you're building up a sandwich of changes. Um, always go back to work out which ones you need and which ones actually maybe were, um, were, were the result of a previous change. And you can end up genuinely, you can end up chasing a, a, a change um, that you've made to try and fix something else. So yeah, the heel. Um, Joe, the answer is yes. Um, the healing is as good as you can get if you take off that reduced red layer um, first. So we actually don't need that layer um, completely gone. Cool. Next up on it, um, the question was about the edit. Um, and overall, so do I think the edit is is okay? I do to an extent in that you, you know, you've got your warm trees, you've you've cooled down the snow. My gut feel though is you've cooled down the snow maybe a little too much. Um and and as well in terms of the the highlight area, we've pulled down some of this stuff to get the detail, and I and I, I get it. Um, we want to see the detail in the snow, so from here to here that's great but the combination of reducing the highlights and cooling it down results in this sort of murky flattened snow um, it doesn't feel like a crisp cold wintry snow it, it now feels sort of like you're sat in the shade um, a bit too much maybe so on it I'd be tempted with the cooling um, maybe just to warm a touch back up to there um, and then potentially with the overall look on the background, just reduce this highlight recovery again a little bit. The alternative, if we want to keep all the detail in those highlights, of course we can push a bit more structure, but instead of um, using the highlight slider to pull everything down, we can use the highlight slider to get some of the detail back, but then push a touch, either levels or brightness, a bit more. Um, brightness will protect those highlights more, and levels will actually clip those highlights if we're not too careful. But you've got enough room in here to push it a little bit. So we go from there to there, which it just feels a bit better. Again, even with that, I'm still tempted to warm up that snow just a touch again, just to here. Um, so here we do now have all the detail. So everything you wanted, you've, you've got all of the, the footprints in the snow, all the texture in the snow. Um, you know, this, this all looks great, crisp, sharp, everything like that. Um, we don't have our red lines on the tree or the, the lightened part of the bark, which is good. Um, and overall, it still feels cold and crisp and wintry, whereas before, maybe it just feel, or felt a little bit flat. Um, and in fact, what I should have done beforehand is uh, probably done um, your edit before we, uh, we loaded this one in. But 
you can see the difference and actually when we go before and after it's now actually a lot more subtle that difference which is probably where I'd, I'd come from um alan's saying uh hi alan so uh, i often get similar effects when i use a heal layer on top of almost any other layer find it best to do the healing and cloning before adding new layers yeah so remember the heal layer is always aiming to go back to raw data for its origin not for what it's painting over but for its source it's always going back to the raw data and and you can actually end up in a bit of a bit of a mess i guess in your head because let's say you've changed the color of these trees to pink i don't know um and then on a layer on top you try and do a heel well the heel that you see is still going to go back to that original brown bark um to to fix the heel then on top of that that pink layer is then going to do its work don't get me wrong so the result can be very similar but it can just get a, a bit confusing so i tend to heal stuff um early on if there's going to be a lot of complex stuff at the you know if you get to the point of oh I missed a dust spot fine do that at the end it's not gonna it's not gonna kill your computer um, but the healing tool just remember it's always gonna pick that origin same with clone from the raw underlying background it's gonna ignore everything else you've done uh, and Claudio I have the issue sometimes with healing wires a thin transparent lighter line appears when the wire where the wires were so <clears throat> I don't know if we've got an example today um, I'll see if we do Claudio but. Um, one of the options is go wider. So effectively, by trying to be so precise, especially in, in a very flat sky or a gradient um, sort of tone, you can end up with Capture One almost creating that wider line than the, than the wire. If you give it a wider brush, um, it can just smooth it in a bit more um, so it's a bit less obvious. Um, oh, saying I want the snow unedited. Um, yeah, it, it's this one's a this one's personal preference, isn't it? My, as I say, my temptation certainly from where we started. Um, my gut feel is this is a bit better. I, I'm sort of tempted, you know. Again, even with the cool, even just to bring that up again, um, the cool snow. We could even if we really wanted to, because we want to keep this detail in the top. Don't remember, oh, don't forget that. So we don't want to blow out the top too much. But I can, of course, create a foreground white. Nice little gradient. So a soft fall off up to here. Um, and with just the foreground, we take maybe the whites up and the highlights up there. So that's without and that's with just to give that nice, crisp, clean feeling to the snow on the ground again. Um, so you know this is again this is down to your own taste but to me that feels more wintry maybe than the flattened version and all of this feels more wintry than the original which was a lot cooler a lot flatter um, and had lost some of the whites the temptation with all of these um, images especially with with highlights with details in is to try and claw back all those details um, sometimes by not doing that by letting it um, hit up to the um, the top exposures it, it just results in a better uh, better output um where are we uh doo -doo -doo. okay <laughs> oh much better okay so we'll stick with that one for now for oh um but if joe wants it without then fine you've got it as a layer um just undo that layer um and you reduce the brightness right next up chris um so chris's issue on this one um actually funnily enough I'm going to probably try and fix a different issue to what Chris actually talked about. So um, let's clone this variant for a start. What Chris has done in this shot is try and get rid of a sun flare. So let me just show you where it sits. Um, so again, our before shot on the left. And aside from the obvious two little dots here, um, Chris wants to get rid of this one and this one here. So we've got rid of it ish there. Now, obviously, on this right-hand one, we can still see where that sun flare was. Um, on the left-hand one, it's a bit murky, but it's sort of fixed. Um, and the question that, that Chris had was around why, you know, how do I get rid of this yellow tone that's in here? Because even though it's been healed out and color adjusted and whatever, it's still quite yellow. And, and yeah, it is. We can we can see it. And again, I think some of this is down to, and if I look at the layers, you know, you've you've tried hard to get rid of it. Um, but I wonder whether 
we could probably look at the simpler option um, and get what we need. So as well, if we look specifically here, the new version, we've actually invented two more bits of snow or water. Um, there's a couple of changes in there in the landscape, so things to be careful of. But overall, we haven't got rid of that lens flare. Now, that's the initial um, issue. For me, there's also a second issue, which is we flattened this sun, I guess, set. I'm not sure whether it's sunrise or sunset. Um, but we flattened it too much. If I look at the original, it's got that lovely glow. And, and you know, we're, we're all desperate to see the outline of the sun. And we'll talk about that in a, an image later on. In the quest to get the outline of the sun, what we've actually got here is the issue of an overexposed area, and it's where there's not a clear line to the sun, so you don't get that, that absolutely perfect pinwheel, um, which you would normally get um, with, a, with a small sun um, out in the distance. So when the sun hits low cloud or, or um, cloud that diffuses the light, that cloud just basically takes on a huge bright glow. And if I turn on our exposure warning, um, on the original, we can see, let's just turn off our before and after, um, we can see absolutely this lot is overexposed, completely. So what Chris has tried to do, effectively, is pull all that back, and you can see as I'm going to after, my exposure warning practically disappears. There's a tiny bit along these ridges here. But basically, what Capture One's saying to us is the stuff that was here, and if I move my mouse over it, we can see on the top, 255, 255, 255, 255. All red, green, blue, and, and overall luminosity channels are blown. They're beyond 255 in RGB terms. So that's why the, uh, the exposure warning is coming on. When we go to our after image, we're at 226. Great. So 225, 226, 226. Overall luminosity, 226. So where's the detail? Um, and we, we've talked about this before, which is there comes a point where something is so clipped that it doesn't matter what I do in terms of pulling back those highlights and even pulling back white. So if I if I go back to white down here as well, nothing. Um, there's even even if I pull down exposure. So that's our exposure at four stops under. There's still no detail in here. Capture One is going to say, "Hey, it's not overexposed anymore," and it's kind of right because we're at 174 on that scale so we're no no longer at 255 great but all it's done is it's taken the no data we had to the right of 255 and it's brought that same no data down to 174 so in other words the stuff that was no information but bright white is now no information but gray so it doesn't help you. Um, and there's there's pretty much when something is completely overexposed, and it was why I touched on it last week um, when it came to the, the HDR versus exposure um, slider. When something is completely overexposed, no amount of, of pulling it back in RAW is going to get you detail back or, or data in those areas. So in this scenario here, I'd have, I'd have been more tempted effectively, just turn off that warning, to let it glow, just leave it like that, as that, as who said, uh, Vance just said, as the giant flaming ball of space hydrogen. Yes. Um, now, of course, it is possible to shoot the sun and not have it completely blown out. But to do that, you're not going to see any detail in any of those shadows. The range or the dynamic range of that shot is just going to be too great. So we've got to choose. Do you want to see the shadow or do you want to see the sun even with a filter in this case i think you'd struggle to see the both of them because of this this high contrast so what would i do um number one um let's let's have a look at this um, lens flare over here um but number two and probably with it's the easier thing to fix first ironically is have a look at this up the top and try and remove some of this um fixing up here so I'm going to undo this highlights layer because this highlight layer effectively, just enable it, was over the sun here and over here. So by removing it, I don't lose any detail. There was no detail here to lose, um, but everything just starts to already look a bit more natural. Background layer. So the background layer obviously hits everything on the screen. And again, we've got that highlight pulled down to minus 100. In other words, try and rescue everything in that dynamic range that the camera possibly recorded. And I'm going to undo that. 
Um, I'm going to pull it down to a little bit, minus 10, just so we don't lose the bits that are a little bit um, overexposed. But the second it goes too blown out, there's no point. You're just going to recover back to gray. Um, where are we? Oh, Jeremy. Um, didn't, so there's no hidden information supplied via the sensor dynamic range. So there is. <clears throat> um, we did a session. Um, if you have a look on the previous live sessions, I think one of the thumbnails has a, like a graph, a, a histogram. And we talk about what HDR can recover. There's a difference between what we see up here on the top left in our RGB histogram, which is 0 to 255, and what the raw file actually contains, what the camera recorded. And the camera can record stuff that's below 0 on the RGB scale and above 255 on the RGB scale. Depending on your camera, it's either going to be better at recovering highlights or recovering shadows, and some cameras can recover a lot more. In other words, they're capturing a lot more information outside of that 0 to 255. Some cameras don't record much at all. If you save your image as a JPEG, you are saving the 0 to 255. Everything either side of it has been completely discarded. So sometimes when something is a little bit blown out or a little bit underexposed, We've got access to that raw data through either the HDR tools or through the exposure slider and, and curves and so on to pull it back into that visible 0255 range. But if something is so overblown or so underexposed, in the case of overblown, all you're going to do is pull back no detail, just at a lower brightness. And in, in the case of underexposed, all you're going to do is pull up noise. So there's a limit that you, you're going to get hit with. Um, and it, it's worthwhile with your own camera just trying to work out where those limits are. Overexposed by two stops, see if you can recover it. Underexposed by two stops, see if you can recover it with an acceptable amount of noise. Um, so in this case, I'm going to leave it at minus 10. But I'm going to add a gradient over this sky because I think the sky's got a lot more to give us. And I can prove that by pulling down our exposure. Look at all this color in that sky. So this is where the camera does have extra information. It's not actually overexposed. And if I pull in a subtle gradient, so the bigger the distance between that top part and the bottom part, the more soft the gradient fall off is going to be. And with this, I'm going to pull down my exposure. Now, this is getting too blue at this side. This is getting not blue enough. So I'm going to rotate it more so we have less of an effect over here and more of an effect on the left-hand side. That's looking pretty good. So already, to me and to my eye, this is a more natural looking interpretation than this one here, which was the original. So I'm happy to leave that flaring. Um, it's as someone, was it Van said, it's a giant ball of um, flaming space hydrogen. There we go. So let it be that. And, and you'll see this especially when the sun hits a cloud and, and that light cloud or um, effectively it's just underneath the cloud and starting to backlight it and whatever. The second that light starts to diffuse over a bigger area, this is what you're faced with. And if you try and recover it too much, it, it actually doesn't improve it. It just makes it look a little bit unnatural. Um, Deepax just asked, is there any way of seeing the raw histogram in Capture One? Um, so as of right now, no, there isn't. Um, so what direction that goes in, I don't know. Um, on certain cameras, so my phase one camera, I can. I see the raw histogram while I'm shooting. Um, so I know what latitude I've got either way. But some of this actually is about having that knowledge of your camera and what you can achieve and what you can recover um, versus what will likely be lost. So on this stuff, you know, genuinely experiment with your kit. Um, get Really get to know your camera and what it can do and what it can't. Um, but for right now, no, um, there's no raw histogram in Capture One. Whether that comes along in the future, I don't know. Um, I can say that honestly because I, I don't know whether that's coming along. Um, but it, yes, it would be a nice one to have. Um, so let's look at our lens flare. <clears throat> and so where Chris had done a lot of adjustments here. So we've got a, a clone tool there. Um, we've got another flare or a color adjustment into a flare up here. Let's just see what that mask is doing. Oh, sorry. That was my layer on there. I've undone Chris's layer. Oops, sorry. Um, but there was another one doing something else there. Um, there's one here, um, which is changing the color on this flare up here. Um, what I am going to do is then just undo my overwriting of that 
layer just in case well there were probably other color adjustments going on in that layer so we're going to duplicate that and turn off Chris's original layer that's a bit cleaner okay so let's just pull that down what we can do actually now we've done that is put a touch of saturation in that looks quite good okay so this is my sky layer so I've turned off the original clone turned off one of the flare recoveries um, turned off another one which is actually over here I think on these hills um, let's just that's this one here so it's changed the color and um, that resulted from this sort of greeny yellow to be a little more neutral then we've got that final healing layer which is this one um, to try and get rid of the original um, flare so I'm going to be quite brutal I'm going to delete <laughs> delete 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 and probably delete that one too so i'm back to our original image with our background layer and the sky layer that i just added so over here instead of trying there is an argument to say we could do this with the color editor um i could try i'm, I'm going to tell you now it's not going to be very effective but i could try and say right a nice soft brush quite small 100 percent flow for the sake of this and we're just going to draw a nice little curve over that flare there and that one there and this should be quite easy right because that's clearly yellowy green whereas everything else isn't so let's go to our color editor um, advanced there's my little picker and say I'm gonna pick on this color here good it's got that sort of yellowy greeny area in there let's pull out to there and I can actually say show me the selected color range so it's gonna make everything else turn gray but here's the problem those trees are also in the same sort of color range so the trees aren't quite as saturated so let's see if we can get it a bit more precise so what I'm looking for is can I get everything else in the shot to turn gray apart from the lens flare and the answer is I can't it's still leaving some of these trees but it's not too bad so let me just turn this off and let's try it so let's desaturate that lens flare let's darken it down Mm. let's change the hue a bit to be a bit redder okay so it's a bit better but I can clearly see where it was and unfortunately you're going to end up in the same place no matter whether you do this through the advanced color editor through the skin tone uh, who was it um Gerard's just said um, maybe the skin tone tool if we do it with the skin tone tool we're also going to affect the stuff to the right and left of it the skin tone tool is about um, creating uniformity across a range of colors it's about broadening a color scope not narrowing it down we could potentially try with the luma range so let's just turn on our mask and say well actually we only want the flare itself so maybe maybe there bit of radius on there to soften it okay um, and of course we've got our weird luma range thinking about it time let's hope it's that um, but the problem here and again you can see in this that lens flare isn't unique so the second I get the luma range tight enough to just cover the lens flare unfortunately it's missing parts of the lens flare and it's still got some of the trees in place it's also taking its time to try and work out what to do with it which is becoming a slightly annoying quirk um, with luma ranges at the moment but let's just see if it sorts itself out if it doesn't we're going to do one of those quick little restart things um, but this is where your color editor is designed to look at hues and saturations to a certain extent but where we've got a mix of colors and textures and all that stuff behind um, the actual lens flare it's going to pick those up too if I try and desaturate something it's also going to lose it from that whole area that I brushed and if I try and darken it, we're going to end up with those dark holes um, where it was. Skin tone tool is going to catch more than just the lens flare. Luma range is going to do two things. It's not going to get you the result you want, and it's going to make capture one hang. Brilliant. So in this case, let's do our familiar little force quit. Fun times. <laughs> and let's go on to capture one again. So load it up we all knew that was going to happen the second i went into a luma range let's face it um so when we, when we get that fixed that's going to be really exciting because i can show you luma ranges without going Ooh. right um 
let's have a look at a different way of doing it, which is actually to undo all of that. And I'm going to create a new clone stamp layer. So under our healing layer up here, so a little um, band-aid, I can go to a cloning mask instead, or I can press S on the keyboard, which gives me a stamp tool too. I'm going to reduce the hardness so it's a soft brush. Flow 100% because I want to replace everything. It doesn't. I've never understood this with with um, stamp and and healing as to why their default isn't 100 on on flow. But fine, there we go. Um, I'm going to choose a origin, and I'm going to paint. And let's just turn off the mask. So press M on the keyboard, and it's gone. And over here, well, we can do two things. I can do it with the clone stamp tool, so we can do that. But that's not going to do too good a job because the difference is too great between the lightnesses so instead we are actually going to use the healing mask and do it as a healing job so let's choose an origin the healing mask remember will automatically choose an origin if you choose for it to do that if it doesn't get the right one you can move it around or you can still use it like you always used to which is use the alt key or the option key on your keyboard choose the origin which will then turn orange and then start painting on the destination and with our healing brush tool, it should do a better job of effectively just merging in a bit more of that tree line. Yeah, not bad. Um, let's actually let's move this one. Sorry. So we're going to say from over here. Oh, no, we're not actually going to do that one. We're going to go from over here and paint in here for these trees and the nice gray above it. If we don't like what it's done, we're just going to pull up a bit more. No, it's grabbing in too much of that yellowy stuff, but we'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to heal into here as well. That's going to do a reasonable job down here. Now, I've got rid of the actual shape of it. Now all I need to do is some of the color work. And that color work, I'm going to go back to my clone layer. And with the clone layer, I'm going to choose from up here. And actually, we are now going to reduce our opacity, not flow, down to about 50% and just blend in with our clone tool. And I'm going to actually move our clone layer above our healing layer. If you think about the reason, I want to do this extra painting, the finishing on top of the healing that's already occurred. What you were seeing before is I'm doing all the clone stuff and then the healing is going on top and then trying to do its own thing. So again, new origin down here, a clone. And at 50%, it's less obvious what we've cloned in because it's blending. And we get to a nicer place. Kind of there. I'm just going to do one more little blend up here. Yep. Okay. So healing with cloning, but the cloning not being done to 100%. And if we want to do more of it, we can. But if I look at the differences in terms of what's obvious here with my lens flares, so there's the original one from Chris. There's our one here, and we can refine this one. So if we want to, we can add a touch of clarity into these areas as well, just to sharpen them up a bit. We can desaturate some of the color. So let's go into my mask, and I'm going to create a new layer. We call it um, Color Fix. With my brush, I'm just going to do a couple of things with it. So let's make our brush a little bit smaller and a little bit softer and we're going to softly go over this area and with it i'm going to bring in some structure so remember when you do the healing you can actually end up softening parts of the image so it looks more obvious that healing has happened and we're going to go into our color editor and we're actually going to use now that yellow color and reduce the saturation a bit not too much and the green saturation down a bit and we get to a pretty good place compared to where we were, which still had this sort of smudge over here. Um, we're in a much better place here where it doesn't look obvious that we had a lens flare there before. We've still got these two lens flares over here. Well, I can obviously go on to our original healing layer. We can use the same layer um, with my healing brush. Make a small brush and choose there. And for this one here and for this one here. Oh, need to choose a different origin. There we go. There we go. Not bad. So, 
Question from Chris. <laughs> can we can we fix the lens flare? Yes, we can. But before we fix the lens flare, I want to fix the sun that caused it. So we go from here, uh, which didn't quite have the lens flare gone. It was, it was a very, very, very thorough attempt. Don't get me wrong. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone into that and all these layers. Um, but before we even start on the lens flare, I just want to fix that sun. So this is our, our new version of that same image. Um, overall, then, what we can do is just go on to a new filled layer. And I'm just going to warm this up a little bit as well, just because we can. It feels nicer when it's a bit warmer. Maybe adjust that tint back to neutral again. Um, and then we could, arguably, with our color editor, go into our blues, pull up a touch of saturation, maybe darken them down a little bit. Um, so that's the cyans and the traditional blues as well. And we end up in a nice place. Um, certainly from a before through to after. We've got a lot of detail back. That's that's really important. But we haven't pushed it so far that we're at this level here. Here we're starting to lose the fact that it's a sunset or a sunrise. It's, it's not calm anymore. It's looking really quite harsh and quite drawn. Um, whereas here we've still got all the natural bits of, of what should be there. Um... Where are we? Uh, Chili saying, yeah, with that lens flare, with that much work, it would be best done in the pixel editor. I, I'm sort of, I, I would sort of agree. I, I think with this, this is probably as close as we're going to get to gone. We, we could do a couple of little further tweaks down here. Um, but if I compare where we were to where we are now, this is a cleaner way of doing it, just relying on one clone and one heel layer. But clone, not always at 100%. Use it to blend in so you don't notice the healing. And also bear in mind, um, like I did with that final color fix layer, you might want to play with structure or sharpening um, and clarity because the healing brush naturally will soften the areas around it. It's, it's designed to blur and blend. And when you've got an area with a little bit of texture in, it looks quite obvious um, that it's missing. So at this stage here, I would also be tempted to pull that into a different app, um, a, a content aware editor in that sense. Um, just to do a really good job on it. But I think we're in a pretty good place from there um, compared to where we were. Right, uh, let's have a look at Roger's shot. And there's not actually a lot I'm going to change in this. So, again, lots of layers. Um, so Roger spent a long time editing this shot. Um, and let's just do a quick before and after. So here's our before shot. It's it's the If we look at the exposure, this is the, the cool thing here. This exposure is as good as you're going to get out of this scene. So we're right on the edge of our highlights. Nothing is overexposed. There's a couple of bits of warning sign up there. But actually, if I pull down our exposure on our background, we can see we've got all the detail in there. There's no, no risk, no issue. Um, but we also haven't crushed any of the shadows. So we've got all the data we want in this shot in one, um, in one go. And Roger was saying, like, this is how it feels, or that's how it felt on a on a on the day that it was shot. There's a nice, clean, crisp blue sky, um, and we've got the tree in more detail. So if we look at the layers that are on here, we've got a sky layer, makes sense. Um, so effectively, that's a gradient layer that's got a luma range on it. We've got a non-sky layer, which is basically the opposite gradient layer, with a luma range for everything that's not in the bright areas of the sky. Oh. Sorry, Roger, you've just <laughs> you just pointed out I've still got Paula's thing on the screen. Now it's gone. Sorry. Um, so we've got these two layers that are that are effectively countering each other. Um, so we've got the sky and we've got the non-sky. The one thing to be careful of on here is on the non-sky layer, you don't have the tree in it. And the reason is this was created from a gradient layer. So obviously, as it gets to the top of the image, the layer falls off. The fact that the tree falls within the luma range makes no difference to this layer because the gradient has it falling off. So if I want to make sure the tree is in that luma range and have the same effect done to it, I'm going to go to the brush icon, soft brush, 100% flow. I'm going to click and it's going to say, do you want to rasterize the mask? The reason it's saying that is because this mask is made up of a gradient. And the second I try and brush onto a gradient, it's no longer editable as a gradient. So there's two ways I can deal with it. One is I can brush. The second is we can just move this gradient up to cover the tree. And to me, that's a more complete version of that layer. 
So whether I do it through brushing or whether I do it through the gradient, we want to make sure that the whole, if I'm going to have a sky layer, let's make sure it's the sky. And obviously it falls off down here. I might be tempted to push this down a bit further. Where I have a non-sky layer, let's make sure it's everything that's not the sky. Um, so including that tree. If we want to be a bit more subtle with it, we can of course vary the amount that it's going up and down. But at least make sure you've got some of the non-sky um, covered in it. We've got a couple of little layers. There's a foreground thing. The, this creek here has had some work done on it um, just to, to boost the colors a little bit. Um, the trees out here in the horizon have been fixed. This mistletoe in the foreground here, just do that, has been brightened and lifted. Be careful with that because you can see what's happened here. Because this has got a luma range, um, you get very harsh fall off um, on those edges. And it's where the 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 edge or what's in the range hasn't got a soft feathered or um, a soft radius on its edges so you get this very binary effect when you look at it up close um, in here let me just come out a little bit so into there and you can see there's a, def or a definite fall off um, that happens so I'm just going to back this layer off a little bit I know you wanted it a bit brighter um, but we're not going to do it quite that much because it just looks a bit artificial uh, our distant tree on the right, there's just a little bit of brightening on there. Again, we've got a mask um, on certain parts of it. And then there's a tiny little, I saw this, a stump on the right-hand side that um, obviously Roger doesn't like. Um, so that's gone. So overall, these edits, they're, they're perfectly fine. I, I don't have an issue with them. The, the challenge I've got is the whole image has gone, you know, very similar to what we said about earlier with the, um, with the snow scene. Very cool and very flat. And there's a couple of things that we can do to try and fix that. So the first is, let's just look at our sky layer here. So we've pulled down the exposure in the sky, pulled down the highlights, pushed up some clarity and so on. But actually what we could do with this is push up a bit of contrast and pull that exposure down a bit more. That's going to give us a bit more of that blue um, out in the sky. Then we come onto the foreground because it doesn't make sense that this is quite so blue on a on a you know on a traditional day that looks like this with you know, Simpsons clouds and blue sky up above. I wouldn't expect to see this level of coolness and, and haziness. It's a bit of a giveaway in a second in what we're going to do in this foreground. Now, luckily, we have our non-sky layer. So remember that layer through the Luma range is everything that's not in the sky. So if I try and warm up the whole image, that's going to affect the blue in the sky. If I try and dehaze some of the image, it's going to affect the blue in the sky. And I don't want to change the blue in the sky. So we're going to use that layer that's everything that's not the sky. And we're going to do a couple of things. The first is I'm going to warm it up a touch. Just to there. So that feels different now in the foreground versus what's, what's out there in the back. The second is I'm going to use the dehaze tool. Now, dehaze, and I mentioned this earlier on, if you're on version 20, um, just be aware you won't have dehaze. That came in 21. Um, but the dehaze tool is effectively a collection of adjustments that are in part curves, in part some contrast change and some clarity change and so on. So lots and lots of different things added into one tool. You can do this in version 20 perfectly well. In fact, I would argue you can probably get to a better result long term. But the quick fix in 21 is to use this dehaze tool. It's already picked up on the fact you've got quite a blue cast across the image, and that's the haze that's cutting out. But this is a big change from this version um, that was your original final one that you sent in, um, Roger, because it just this one now feels flat compared to where we go here. This feels like that afternoon with a nice blue sky with, um, with a lot of, uh, I guess, texture in the clouds and so on. There are some challenges up here um, with that. And again, it's that Luma range. Um, so I'm tempted, oh, this could go wrong again, bear with me. Um, if I put a bit of a radius on, just to soften that fall off. And the same with the sky layer. I'm gonna put a bit of a radius on. And that radius, what it's doing is at the edges where something is not or is in a Luma range, instead of just going binary off on, it softly sort of feathers that range in or out. Um, and it means that you end up with a less digital look at the edges of where a Luma range is applied. 
Um, so that's where I'd get to with this one. Um, as I say, there's very little change I'm doing to your actual edit. Um, all we've done is just refined a couple of the layer changes, um, boosted the sky a little bit. Let's just do them side by side. So here's the new version. Um, and there's the original, um, the, the final tiff that you sent. And it just feels a bit richer, especially when we look at the tree here. Um, let's just come and look at these together. When we look at this tree detail, it's just got that sort of summery feel to it rather than, um, or springy summery feel, rather than this sort of washed out version here. Um, so, where are we? A couple of questions. Andrea, uh, will there be any support for DNG files from DJI drones, like distortion correction and light fall off? I've done some work on a DNG from a D, well, from my DJI drone. Um, so, I'm not sure whether we're missing something there. Um, Hmm, a bit strange. Um, I, let me try and think back in my memory bank as to whether or not we were actually editing. Well, no, we were. It was a, it was a raw DNG. So we can do distortion correction. Um, hmm, a bit strange. Let me experiment with that, and I'll come back to you, Andrew. Um, Claudio, we could use split toning. We could, however, let me show you where there's a problem with the split toning. Our split toning is going to be based on effectively shadows and highlights. Very rarely do we want to change the mid-tone or the you can for a, for a color pop. In the distance out here and in here, down in this sand, this is still going to fall. If we look at where our histogram is, this is still up here in the upper mid-tones up towards the highlights area in certain areas. So when we, when we start playing with, you know, let me just clone this so we don't um, undo it, but let's create a filled layer. If I start playing and saying, right, the highlights can go cool, the sky, but the shadows we want to go warm, we do get it. But look at the effect it's having here on the grass as well. Um, without it, sort of adding some blue tones into this area down here too. And it's making them a little bit unreal. Um, <clears throat> so in landscape terms, unless you're going for a styled look, which you can do, obviously, um, I'd, I'd be careful with color balance. I'd be tempted to use white balance more than color um, balance in terms of split toning for a landscape. Um, if you're trying to style it, if you're purposely trying to go, you know, a, a fully you know, um, washed out or whatever, whatever vintage cross-processed look or whatever, then absolutely that's what color balance is for and it's going to be your best friend in, in doing that. Um, but in terms of keeping a natural landscape, I'd genuinely just try and rely on your white balance more. It's going to do more for you. Okay, um, and where are we, Nicholas? So, yeah, a little alteration can make a big change. Yeah, it, it absolutely can. So, you know, if we look at where we come from, this is there's nothing wrong with this image. And remember, let's go back to the original. So the original original was here. It's not much difference. All we've done is pull up some of the details, and, and Roger's done most of that already. Um, and kept some of the clarity in the sky. But the difference between these two is just a case of cutting out some of that foreground haze, warming up the foreground, getting the grass back to being a bit more rich and vibrant. Um, so we end up here uh, rather than this relatively hazy sort of look. And remember, not all of that was through dehaze. Dehaze was some of it. It was maybe 10% or well, 15 as it were. Um, but the rest of it was around white balance um, and also adding a bit of contrast in. Okay, Carlos, uh, your shot of an airport. I don't remember where this airport was. Sorry, um, you may have said, but um, where are we? Iberia. Uh, trying to work out where it is based on the planes that are in there, but all their tails are <laughs> the wrong way. Okay, so let's go to our original and our final. And Carlos's question, you know, A, is the edit okay? And, and in general terms, yes, I think it is. It's, it's fine. It's a... It's a city silhouette um, at sunset over an airport. Pretty nice. Ah, there we go. Uh, Madrid. Bingo. So, um, I was right with Iberia. I didn't know what the other ones were. So, let's let's have a think about what what's not quite right in this. And the only thing, genuinely, if, again, look at these layers. Um, so, you've done a lot of work on, in fact, healing the plane tails. Oh, the trails. Sorry, I thought you meant tails. Um, yeah, so we've got rid of some of the contrails that were in the sky, um, lightened up the foreground, as you say, Brighton Airport. There's a Luma range on there as well. Um, 
and we've also got some of the um, some of the, the details enhanced using clarity and stuff like that just to, to boost this. If, so again, if we go before and after, um, some of this has been sharpened up. Now remember, bear in mind, you can see it here. As we pull up things like clarity and structure, you're also pulling up noise, especially from the shadows. So if you're happy with this amount of noise, remember we're at 300 and something percent. Let's go out to 100. It's pretty good at 100. I wouldn't be too worried about it, but just don't push it too far that you can see too much noise. Out here, we've got a little bit of an issue around some of these buildings. Um, so we've got diffraction correction turned on. It's possible that this was on, this is on an 80 millimeter length. Maybe um, we had a bit of movement, maybe a bit of wind, and it's a bit further away. Um, we're going to put some defringing on just to get rid of some of the color on the edges, but we've got to basically got to live with that. There's going to be not so perfect lines out in the far, far distance. But it's this color in the foreground that I'm worried about, and it's the only thing we're going to change. So in the background up here, we yeah, we could play if we wanted to. Let's just put a lovely... Um, where are we? Oops, sorry, that's your Brighton Airport layer, new layer. Uh, we could put another gradient up here and go fully... You know, way. Um, we can invent something that wasn't ever there or real or whatever. We can make the sunset even more vivid. We can, you know, we can do all those little tricks. But actually, I kind of like the original tone of this, where it doesn't quite work is matching the foreground tone, because this is just so green and, and blue and so cold compared to up here. So what we're going to do is going to use your Brighton Airport layer. And if I look at our background, we've got the same um, white balance on the whole image as our airport layer. So nothing wrong has happened here. And, and genuinely, that airport would have felt a little cooler than the sky behind. But I'm just going to try using that range that you've already built and warm it up a touch. Maybe into there and shift that tint a touch away from the greens. Now, what I'm looking for is, have we changed the concrete to be something that's not very neutral? We're still pretty good. We're okay. These lights and, and poles are still looking a little bit green, but they're certainly better than where we were. Um, so let me just reset that so we can see. And I'm going to do a clone so you can see the difference. Let's just go a bit further this time. Uh, maybe there. Maybe to there. So if I look at these side by side now, now you'll see how green that one on the top looks compared to this one on the bottom. Um, and it's a small change. It's a tiny, tiny change. But it's just about not stretching that, you know, the light source from, from the shade. Whenever we look at shade, especially in a silhouette, it is going to be a different tone to the light source. If you've got a warm sunrise or sunset, the shade is going to be cooler because it's in the shade for sure. But this just comes down to whether or not it feels nice as an overall image um, to have that left there. Um, where are we, Paul? I'd crop it to get rid of some of the foreground and even out with the sky. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, there's a few options in here. Let's just um, clone that again. If I go to our crop. So effectively, we could... Where are you? I'm guessing two by one on this. Uh... Not quite. Let's go to two by one. You know, we could almost get to this sort of territory here. So we've got to lead in along here from that runway. Not a massive fan of putting that smack bang in the middle for, for most circumstances. But it's not the end of the world if it is. But even down there, it's pretty good. And I'd, I'd be tempted to have it as a, you know, from there to there. This feels maybe a little cleaner. Um, maybe have it as a two by one um, instead of that that sort of traditional. Um, I don't know if it was sixteen by nine or three by two, but something not quite two by one. Um, so we get to here. I think that's pretty good. Um, we could again go even further. So let's clone that again. And with our crop, I'm going to move it all the way up to there. So a completely different setup. Um, so we end up with three different options based on the crop. But again, it's a very small change that we've made in here. Um, from there, the original, uh, so that's what Carlos sent in. 
Um, and there's our new, and it's literally just a case of just warming up that foreground. Everything else on there, Carlos, I wouldn't alter. If you want to keep with this crop, and almost to Paula's point, just to remove the distraction in the foreground, I would be tempted to put a tiny gradient, a really soft one, in the bottom and just pull down that exposure a bit. Just so we're pushing the viewer up to the middle. Um, and that's... Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I'd get to. Um, certainly, you know, and again, we can crop, we can play, we can do different things um, with it. But in each and every case, this is just around playing with the framing now, rather than the color uh, that we're worried about. Um, oh, are we going to have time to play with this? I think we are. We're going to do a quick one. Sorry, oh, um, we've done some of yours before, so so we're we're good. Um, so a couple ones on this one. Um, as a seascape, it's it's a nice scene. We've got some lovely lead-in stuff in the foreground. I'm just going to straighten that up to start with. Um, so this is our literal before, after, no changes. Um, now what I will do, and you're going to probably guess this, so those of you not on 21, you're not going to have this. If you are on 21.1, you're going to have the style brushes, and we're going to use my fun time deep sky. Soft... Um, brush and I'm just going to enhance that sky I don't want to enhance the rest of the shot I want to keep the rest of the shot quite neutral um, but just to emphasize those clouds up there with the foreground down here I'm going to create a new um, adjustment layer and call it foreground and we're going to pull up along here not quite straight we're actually going to follow the line of that sand along there and we're going to actually use it to bring up some clarity more in the foreground and then effectively have it softly disappear off into the background so we don't have things getting clearer as they get further away. That doesn't make sense. So we're using clarity on a gradient layer for that reason. I'm going to pull up some contrast. And I'm also going to pull up a little bit of warmth. Now we've got that nice little um, contrast between effectively this, this sort of beachy, sandy colour. Let me just um, pull down... Our fall off here. So this warmy sort of beachy sandy color against that bluey color in the background. And deep sky, I can then actually pull down that white balance a touch as well um, to really nice, uh, nicely set it off. Then based on where or what we've got in the middle of the frame, I'm actually in a place where we're going to go traditional, um, go to our background and pull down a bit of a vignette. If we don't like the way that it's done it, and it's not quite right because of the way the light's falling, Instead of doing it with a vignette, we can do it with gradients, um, whether that's a radial gradient, this one, or a linear gradient. So with a linear gradient, I'm going to call it Top Sky Darken. And I'm just going to even up. If you see, this right-hand side is a lot darker than the left-hand side. So we're going to even that up just by pulling down our exposure. And in the foreground, we're going to do the same. So we're going to say Bottom Foreground. Ugh can't type darken where are my keys right um, and then again following that line of the sand up here just a touch just pulling that exposure down so I'm leading up into our subject of the shot and that's it I might want to check that we've got our uh, diffraction correction on at f11 I haven't looked at it um, tightly enough but let's put it on um, in this case and there we go we go from uh, let me just come off of this layer so we don't have a weird gradient on there we go from there to there in three minutes flat that wasn't bad um bear in mind how long we spent on some of the other ones so you know this scene sometimes if it is this simple i would leave it as this simple this is a nice shot it's a nice scene if you play with it too much it's just going to go over the top there's our original it looks nice it's washed it's natural it's it's clean um here we've just what we've done is effectively boost up some of that foreground color really make the sky a bit more dramatic and then pull in some of those lighter areas with with targeted gradients so not just that round vignette that, that does it globally but some targeted angles on the gradients um, just so that you get the sort of sense of pulling up um, and looking at our subject so that's it for today so we've got um, Earl's very quick seascape edit um, Carlos's airport uh, Roger's tree in the summer so Again, that, that dehaze tool is a really quick fix for this, but it's not just about dehaze. It's about the other things like warming up the white balance. Um, Chris's sunset shot, 
you know, don't try and push something that's overexposed too much. Let it go if it's gone um, and use that to your advantage. Make it look like that um, was the point of the scene. And as we started with um, Joe's um, red lines, but also, you know, how white should snow be, um, that's up to you and your interpretation. So there we go. Um, that's it for today. Remember, um, we can carry on all of this discussion um, on that Facebook group. So um, you'll find it on Facebook. Just search for, well, my name and then put live on the end. Um, that's between now and next week. Uh, we'll be back on again, same time next Thursday. So three o'clock in the UK. We did check with everyone. Uh, most people said they want to stick with this time. Um, in the meantime, you've got access to all of those pro tips, which are the sort of 20-minute quick guides into all the tools on Capture One. Not just 21, but also 20 and even 12 and 11. Most of them apply to all the uh, all the versions. Please keep sending in your um, raw files. So do that on that tool. So paulreeforlive.wetransfer.com. If you don't include your name, we can't include your picture. I, I know I keep saying it and it's crazy, but please just tell us who you are um, so that we can actually edit your file. And other than that, we will see you in a week. Um, so as always, stay inside if you've been told to stay inside. Get outside if you've been told to get outside. And we'll uh, catch you next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.